Hey, Deserve listeners, 90 Day Fiance, the tell all. Let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As I always say, don't use YouTube as a replacement for therapy. If you need a therapist, get one. You deserve it. Let's watch. I have a question for you. Yeah. Did you already fight your, your friend? Me and David got a long history. Like, we. But you dated his sister? I dated his twin sister. <laughs> yeah, and you didn't know? No. No, he beat my ass, put me in a coma, and then my mom was like, you going to boot camp. So she sent me to military school. And then right when I got out of military school. Okay, very interesting. We get a little bit of history. I don't know why I always want more, but that's a huge detail in terms of their relationship between Jabri and the mom. And I suspected something along these lines, although I wouldn't have suspected that the mom would have sent him to a, a boot camp and then to a military, let's rewind that. <laughs> yeah, and you didn't know? No. No, he beat my ass, put me in a coma, and then my mom was like, you going to boot camp. So she sent me to military school. Oh, so he's referring to military school as a boot camp. All right. So I don't often get a chance to talk about this. I talked about this quite a bit during my reaction to the documentary about Paris. This is Paris, Paris Hilton, because that's what happened to her. She was sent to a therapeutic school that is essentially a prison for children that parents will send their, their children to, and it's very expensive. But anyway, so I didn't suspect that the mom would do that because therapists typically will not recommend that because we know that those kinds of services don't usually work, and they're extremely expensive. In the beginning, as a family therapist, I worked about a third of my clients were families with teenagers that were defying rules, you know, skipping school, running away, using substances, shoplifting bad grades, quote unquote bad friends, maybe a lot of conflict with the parents, that kind of thing, maybe gang activity. And so I would have a lot of parents ask me, should I send my kid to one of these boot camps, to one of these military schools or a therapeutic school? And at first I didn't really know what to say because in graduate school we didn't talk about it ever, I don't think. It's not really a, a very common topic that we talk about. But as time went on, I worked with enough families that would send their kids to these various different therapeutic schools and or what we, we might call military school or reform school or boot camp or something. And I found that there's a wide variety of the types of these kinds of institutions. And some are not so bad and some are absolutely abusive. And in fact, some are across borders, maybe in Mexico or other countries where they don't have the same laws about children and their safety or even other states. I think Utah has more relaxed laws about these kinds of schools. And so I think, don't quote me on that, but there's, I think it's Utah where the schools can do more to the children, can be, shall we say, more restrictive, more disciplinarian, more harsh, use corporal punishment, where in other states we have passed laws where we say you can't do that. It's abusive to the kids. You can't, you can't do that kind of thing. And certainly when you go across the border into places like Mexico and other kinds of places, and I, I don't know the laws in Mexico, I just know that either the laws are more relaxed or they're not enforced or I don't know, but I would hear about absolute torture happening to teenagers who would go to some, some of these other schools. So, and you, you can watch the Paris Hilton documentary for more information about that. And she went to schools in the States, I think to Utah. I would work a lot with families in this capacity and over time, and I would learn how much it would cost. It would cost $100,000, $500,000. I would have parents who would put their home up for a second mortgage so that they could afford this. And the the claims that these schools would make that they would have, you know, 98% success rate and their websites will be very elaborate. We have all these services and we have psychiatry and counselors and therapy. And, you know, they have these endorsing children that are emerging. They're just like, I loved this. It would really helped me get back on track. And now I love my parents. And certainly that can happen. But I found that the claims were completely overblown. And when you actually look at the research, the success rate is far lower than what they will claim. The other thing is that a lot of kids will just kind of age out of their defiance anyway. So you, you put them anywhere for a year and a good number of them will just grow up and be less defiant. I would work with a lot of kids that were 14, 13, 15. 14 was kind of the magic year that everything would go wrong. Certainly there were 
kids that I worked with that were defiant at other ages, but 14 was usually like when it was the worst. And by 17, the kid would have calmed down quite a bit. And by 19, the defiance would be completely gone. Not always, of course, but uh, that was a pattern that I would see often. So you, you take a 14 year old who's going through that very difficult time and you put them in a boot camp, and a year later they're better. Well, they probably would have been better anyway. So there's that. And then I found a lot of kids would go to these boot camps, these therapeutic schools, and they would come back and they would be more angry and more upset because a big reason I found that kids actually would follow rules was because of the bond that the child felt with the parents. Because a lot of the times what you would do, and this happened to Paris Hilton as well, you can't get the kid physically to go to these schools. You know, if you're just like, hey kid, we're putting you in military school. Well, the kid could refuse to get into the car, that kind of thing, right? So what they will do is you will hire what I would call these goons. I don't know how I got that term, but Essentially, they're just hired handlers that will drive up in a van. There's usually two of them. And in the middle of the night, while the kid was sleeping, this would all be prearranged with the parents. And this is expensive, too. These goons would come into the house while the kid was sleeping and just grab the kid physically and drag them into the van and drive them across state lines so that they could put them in a restrictive therapeutic school in another state or another country. And in this moment, and Paris Hilton describes this very well, it's extremely violating. You're being dragged out of the house. You think you're being abducted and you look up and your parents are actually approving of this. And you're like, wait, what? Now, for a lot of parents, they are resorting to this because they're suffering. I, I'm going to take a guess and say that Jabri's mom was suffering a lot. There, that Jabri was in all likelihood if she resorted, because she is a therapist, so presumably she knows of other options and has some way of trying to figure out a, a way to alleviate the problem. But anyway, so I'm just going to assume that Jabri's mom was dealing with a lot of defiance, a lot of issues, a lot of self-destructive behavior. That's usually why these kinds of things happen. Now, in the clients that I worked with, I always understood why the parents were considering these drastic actions. It wasn't because the parents were bad. It wasn't because the parents were just trying to get rid of their kids. It was always because there were legitimate reasons to consider it as an option, particularly when you get the marketing pamphlet or the website that claims like the kids will be magically cured and everyone wins and just give us $200,000 and you'll you'll get your kid back, that kind of thing. So it's not usually because the way that the media or the way people will typically describe it, it's like there's these really bad parents just sending their kids off to boot camp. It's also not the other narrative that people will have that like the kid is some sort of monster. Certainly there would be some kids that were, wow, my dog, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Sometimes, so there's, you know, if you have a dog, there's different kind of barking that your dog will uh, do and uh, that sort of barking was like there must be a an animal outside or a, that's probably usually a cat maybe because there's when it's a well maybe it's another dog outside anyway <laughs> it's like startling it was right there anyway so there the other narrative is that the kid would be a monster and certainly sometimes that was i, I wouldn't say it that way but you would have teenagers that would um, really terrorize and abuse the parents. And so, but that was rare. The the narrative, like when you watch these Dr. Phil shows where they're like, you know, boot camping these kids, a lot of the kids, the vast majority of the kids that were defying rules, this kind of thing, they were suffering from traumas of some sort and had developed years before a style of coping, which was to put up walls, to act like they don't care about anything, to turn away from the family. And if I could reach them, which would take a long time, because teenagers typically don't want to be in therapy, and so they're not willingly talking with me to begin with, and so that was a challenge. So for a lot of kids, when things are going well, the reason why they follow the parents' rules is because, not because of structure, I mean, maybe partially, but also because the kid wants to please their parents. There's this really false notion in our society that when you have a defiant kid, the answer is more structure. And there's a lot of family therapists who believe in this as well. And it's just not what I found to be accurate. That 
if you have a defiant kid, a lot of the time, what led to that was the kid lost their bond somehow with their parents. And when they say they want to see their friends. So you have a 13 year old who has lost their bond from their parents for one reason or another. They want to hang out with their friends and they're like, hey, I'm going to go hang out with my friends. And the parents are like, no, you're not. It's too late or it's past your curfew or you didn't do your homework. And the parent in, in, you know, imposes some sort of structure and the kid is has a choice. They can either stay home with the person that they hate, who is now restricting their their behavior, or they can run away or just leave the house and hang out with their friends, people that actually make them feel acceptable and loved and connected. And they'll they'll choose that one. Whereas if you have a child that does have a bond with their parents, and they're like, hey, I'm going to hang out with teenagers, and the parent's like, same exact thing. He's like, no, you're not. You have to do your homework. It's too late. It's, it's a school night. You got to stay home. The kid has a totally different choice. They can hang out with their friends who they want to hang out with, but one, they're not desperate for a connection because they already have a connection at home with their parents. Also, they might have an urge to run away, but they're like, well, I would really disappoint my parents and, you know, I don't want to deal with that, even though I think I should be able to hang out with my friends because what's the big deal? But... I don't want my parents to be upset. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to make them angry. I don't want to create distance. I don't want to disappoint them, that kind of thing. So structure, you can have the same structure, the same structure, but the bond is what changes the scenario. And so what would happen is you'd have this breakdown in bond for whatever reason. And sometimes the parents would be okay parents and the bond would just break down for other reasons. And obviously there are times when the parents are not so great, or the kid had some kind of problem early in life unrelated to parenting. Anyway, I won't go into the weeds on that. But so then you have this breakdown of the bond and then the kid starts to defy running away and the bond becomes even more threatened because the parents are doubling down on discipline and they're doubling down on the uh, structure and they fail to add intimacy and affection and love and bonding things and of course it's really hard to do that when your kid is pushing away from you even you know because of their defiance but also because they're just becoming a teenager and this is why it's so important to and i would work with families on this that you have a bond a pretty strong bond going into adolescence if you have a strong bond at 10 then the bond will still be threatened when they're 14 in all likelihood, but it will be able to withstand the onslaught of adolescence. Whereas if you have not a great bond at 10, then things will really fall apart at 14 potentially. And the, the difference is at 10, you won't, no, you won't necessarily notice the problems. The problems that exist in a family and in a relationship with a child don't usually manifest until the kid is 14. Certainly it can manifest, or at least be noticeable in terms of externalizing of behaviors. So, you know, you take a, the average defiant 14 year old and rewind the clock back to when they were 10, and there might not have been any noticeable behavioral differences between them and other kids. But when they're 14, then everything starts to come out because the kid wants to individuate. They start to have raging hormones, as they say. Um, they have the idea that they can have more freedoms, they have more urges to, to do things with other people. And so when the breakdown and the bond happens, then the defiance happens and the bond really starts to go. And then the parent goes, you're going to military school, the goons take, then the kids watching the parents just let it happen. They go to this military school and they're sitting there for the first few months, just seething with anger. And there's no opportunity for bonding because a lot of these therapeutic schools will actually make it so you can't talk to the parents. Sometimes they will involve parents, but but anyway, there's not a lot of opportunity for bonding with the parents. So the relationship degrades to nothing. It just completely snuffs out any possibility of having a bond. And then the kid emerges. Maybe the kid complies and figures out, okay, well, I have to comply with this boot camp situation. But all the while, they're like, screw my parents. As soon as I'm out, then I'm gone. And that would happen a lot. The kid would get out of therapeutic boarding school, military school, whatever you want to call it. And they would come home. And within a few days, they would just sort of gather their things, you know, make connections with people and they would run away and they'd never come home. That happened a number of times. So 
those stats and those anecdotes are not included on the websites of these of these therapeutic schools. These details are not usually discussed on the Dr. Phil shows of the world. You know, there's all those talk shows where you just have the crowd yelling at the teenager that's being defiant and like, yeah, you need him. And then you have some literal boot camp guy, a drill sergeant just screaming in their face. And I'm just like, it's just so upsetting. So we learn that Jabri went to one of these schools. Now, maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it was a bad thing. I don't know. But I just thought I would give some background on that. So my hypothesis that Jabri, because, you know, the mom would frequently talk about how he would always make bad choices and how she was like totally against this marriage, even though there wasn't anything to us, at least to me watching the show, that would indicate that it was a terrible choice, right? I mean, they might divorce down the line, but you know, plenty of people do that. And he's 28, 29 years old or something like he's free to make that choice. So I suspected that the mom long ago had been burned so many times with his bad choices. And we could even add on going into a coma. I mean, just imagine that. So here's a possible uh, story narrative of the situation from a fairly early age, maybe particularly when he's a young teen, he starts to defy rules and the parents are trying to work with him and he's it, things aren't working out for one reason or another. I don't know why that would be. I mean, given the dynamic we saw with the parent, I don't know, it's just a lot of possibilities, but they it gets worse and worse and the parents are struggling, they're trying to work. They're like, hey, you need to follow the rules. He's like, you know, I'm gonna be myself or whatever, we just imagine Jabri. Jabri goes into a coma. So imagine as parents, you arrive at the hospital and your kid is in the is in a coma. The damage, you, know, you don't know what they're going to be like when they wake up. They could have brain damage, they could die, they could never come out of the coma. So there's it's a very, very scary situation. So you can imagine as a parent, if there was any kind of ambiguity there. For a lot of parents, there there's some ambivalence around like, well, I want to be more controlling because my kid is out of control, but I also don't want to be a jerk. And I, I want them to learn from their own mistakes. And I want them to have some freedoms. And I, I, I want them to be happy, but they're screwing themselves over. You know, So there's this tension. And every parent kind of navigates that in a different way. But we can imagine for the mom before the coma, having more nuance to her approach and then the coma happens and she's like there's no more nuance i need to control everything he does because every decision that he makes could lead to him being dead and he's proven that to be the case i was pleading with him to act differently and he kept going down that road and here he is in the hospital all bets are off i'm going to control i'm going to control i'm going to micromanage i'm going to keep him i mean this isn't a conscious thought but I'm going to treat him like a child until he absolutely proves to me without a shadow of a doubt that he can be responsible. And of course, even kids in their 20s aren't going to be able to prove to their parents that they're without risks in their life. So that de develops into a dynamic. I'm making up a whole story here. Of course, it's completely speculative, but that the mom became more codependent, more overfunctioning, more mi micromanaging. He was stifled, didn't really know what to do, was kind of in between being okay with it, but also not okay with it. And that perpetuated much longer than it should have in terms of Jabri's age. And all the while, Jabri is still making quote unquote bad choices, but you know, a lot of 20 year olds make choices that their parents wouldn't be enthusiastic about, like being in a band, for example. I mean, most parents wouldn't be enthusiastic about that. But like, how about a career? You know, it's kind of... Then they get to the Miona situation, and the mom is just in this mindset of like, this has to be a bad idea. This has to be a, a risk. This has to be dangerous because Jabri always does... The, he always makes the bad choice. I, I need to always assume that he's making bad choices because remember that one time when I thought it was okay for him to date that one woman... That one girl in high school and he went into a coma like I need to never ever think that again and so I am convinced that this wedding is uh, you know 110 percent a bad thing and it's not only a bad thing but it's a horrible thing and so I'm very busted up on the inside I'm not going to go to the wedding so we could see that being a scenario right yeah and I was hypothesizing this anyway and 
before even knowing about the military school. But it does add, again, I'm making up a lot of, of stories here. All right, well, that does it for that episode. If you want to become a patron of the podcast, that's how we know that you like what we're doing. It really does support us when you do that. We, I wouldn't be able to do any of this if it weren't for the patrons. So thank you if you are a patron. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.